Hello, my name is Kathy Parker from the Libraries at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. And this is our series, Means and Methods, where we investigate the ways that new knowledge is constructed by talking to our faculty about their research. And with me today is Dr. Ellen Block from our sociology department, whose research has led to a new publication. And welcome, Ellen, glad to have you with us today. Thank you so much. And tell us about your book. Um, okay, well, here it is. I brought a copy with me. It's called Infected Kin, and it looks at how HIV has impacted um, families in Lesotho. It's a little country inside Southern Africa, inside South Africa, um, and it has an HIV prevalence rate of about 23%. So this book looks at how orphans are being cared for and how that's changing families and sort of permeating the, the social landscape more broadly than just in impacting those who have been orphaned by AIDS or those who are infected by AIDS. So that's the general approach of the book. And, and how did you go about doing research for this book? So I'm an anthropologist, um, and so I use ethnographic methods. I started working in this community in 2007, um, and I've been back and forth many times and spent about two years living there with um, on the site of this NGO. Um, and the NGO provides care for orphans and vulnerable children and has an outreach program and a bunch of other programs. And um, so basically I started by just shadowing the organization and kind of figuring out what the questions and issues were. And then I started doing more targeted interviews in the, in the rural villages of the, this highland district of, of Lesotho called Mkholong. So uh, one of the things that we're interested in is how we share new information or new knowledge with people. And I think you've taken uh, a new kind of approach in this book. What's unique about the way that you've um, disseminated your research through this book? Yeah, so a, a standard typical ethnography, which is the book that an anthropologist produces from their fieldwork, would typically be a solo authored um, book that's based on this ethnographic research and engages with theories of anthropology. And I've done all that, but I also, um, when I'm in the field, my husband, who's a creative nonfiction writer and has also written a book about Lesotho on his own, um, he's been with me. And so we decided to collaborate on this project. So every chapter starts with a creative nonfiction story that he wrote. And then the bulk of the book is still the sort of more standard ethnographic writing of anthropology. But we kind of the motivation for that was we wanted to highlight sort of, you know, if you're writing a book about AIDS orphans, it's hard not to do that without only focusing on suffering. But we think there's more to people's lives than suffering, even when they're orphaned from HIV or there's a 23% HIV prevalence rate or they're living in, you know, um, difficult conditions. So we thought by including creative nonfiction, which is able to kind of do more with language, leave gaps and spaces for the reader to infer and kind of show different sides of a person, we're able to sort of get a more full picture of, of what humans' experiences are like, rather than just focusing on the suffering of an AIDS orphan and their families. Can you give us an example of maybe how you arrived at a more well-rounded understanding because of this approach? Sure, so um, there's two parts to that. One is the content and one is the process. So let me talk about the process first. Okay. So the collaboration was really fun because I love Will's writing and I think he does a beautiful job at it. So, um, you know, I wasn't too, uh, what do you call it, too, too um, kind of nitpicky about what he was doing or, or, you know, I pretty much like what he produces. <laughs> so uh, I guess there could be some space for conflict there, but there wasn't. But basically what I did was I had an idea about which family I wanted to highlight at the beginning of each chapter. And I had a couple reasons maybe why I picked that family. Maybe the chapter is about how maternal grandmothers are doing the majority of the care. So I would p pick a family that had a maternal caregiver. Um, and then I would kind of make a sort of cheat sheet for him that said, here are the points that I want to include. Um, from this family's story, but otherwise I don't want him to be influenced by how I had previously written it. So I didn't allow him to read my version of, of the tell, retelling. I just gave him all my raw field notes. So he had all the interviews, all the transcripts, all the field notes that I had with that family, photographs, anything I had, and most of them he had also met. And then I just had a couple points. This is the argument I'm making in this chapter, and here are the few points that I need you to 
um, include, but otherwise do anything you want with it. So he could really have the space to take it in whichever direction he wanted. So the opening um, story in the first, in the introduction to the book is about Juwala, which is the Sasutu word for home-brewed beer, and this family that brewed this beer, and this, this grandmother, grandfather, who are a really lovely couple um, that we know very well. So it starts with that story, but then kind of has a, a bit of a tragic ending to that one. But um, So really it was up for, to him to take it where he wanted to go, and it allowed him to pull out details that maybe when I'm reading through my interviews, using my ethnographic eye, I'm not looking for. But he notices something as a writer that he thinks is great for bringing out people's full, the sort of full human portraiture. So that's kind of how he did it. The last mm -hmm. chapter, um, he most of the chapters he's done from his own voice, but the last one he does it from the perspective of an 11-year-old girl. And so that's just something I would never mm -hmm. think to do or be able to do because professionally I'm supposed to, you know, be, I'm not supposed to leave things out. I'm supposed to make those sort of imaginary leaps, but he can because of that sort of um, the, the type of writing that he does. So it was really a nice way to allow these different stories to come out without sort of violating the <laughs> tenets of my discipline. What drives your interest in this and your passion for doing this kind of work? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, the, the book, even though it's about children who have been orphaned by HIV and some of whom have HIV or HIV positive themselves, it, you know, people's first response is often, this is so sad or, you know, some, in some way pitying. And what Will and I wanted to show, especially with this integration of the creative nonfiction and the ethnographic writing, but just in the book itself is, even though people, there's hardships, people are trying to make good in their lives. How are people going about the world trying to make them better despite their circumstances. So this book is about care primarily, and it's about how people are caring for each other in difficult times, how they're loving each other. So I just have a few questions for you to, to get a sense of your life as a scholar. Um, and I guess I would say these would not be when you're in the field, but mm -hmm. when you're back actually writing the book mm -hmm. or doing the preparatory work before you go into the field. Right. So. Uh, early bird or night owl? Hmm. I think naturally I would be an early bird, but I'm not because I always stay up late. And <laughs> I wish I hadn't, but if um, I was left in nature, I would probably wake up early. <laughs> um, and as you're beginning to do your work then, are you um, mostly working at home or in your office on campus? Uh, I do a combination of things. It's sort of sometimes I'm working, you know, on the... Um, in my carpool or sometimes I'm working the side of the, the kids soccer game or in an airport or wherever I happen to be I've gotten pretty good at using the best of whatever time I have so but if I'm really gonna write then I, I like to be at home and in quiet people are very friendly on these campuses so I get a lot of visitors which I love but it's not conducive to really zoning in on your work. And you're fueled by coffee or tea? Coffee. Coffee. In the morning, tea and, in the afternoon. And um, working away on a laptop or a pen and paper? Um, I take my field notes with a pen and paper and everything else I do, do on a laptop. So I don't write on a laptop when I'm actually writing stuff that's going to be in a book or article. I mean, on a, comp on a p piece of paper, I, I like to edit as I go along and cut and paste things. And I don't think I could keep up with my brain by hand. So. Yeah. And when you do your library-based research, um, do you have a preference for ebooks or print books or journals or? I mean, I, I far prefer physical books, and I, I like ones that I can write in. So if it's a book I really want to devour, I'll buy it for That's myself. Right. <laughs> but but I, I'll use anything. I, I try to save paper as much as I can. So I, if I can't get it from the library, I don't own a copy, then I'll read it online instead of printing it. But. I would prefer to print it. I just don't. <laughs> and you've got a, a really full schedule. I know you're doing a lot of really excellent work here at the college and, and then your research as well. Um, but when you do get a chance for fun, are you reading a book, you know, watching TV, movies? Yeah, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I read a lot of books, only fiction, because I read so much nonfiction for, um, for, for work that I've always got a lot of fiction books on the go. 
And then I play a lot of ultimate frisbee. So that's the other thing that I do fairly frequently. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us thank today. It's been a me. pleasure to hear about your work. And thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll have another conversation soon. Thank you. Thank you.